with HES. Lovely, thanks very much. Uh, I think you've hit record now, haven't you? Perfect. Uh, okay, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. I've got some slides to go through with you. Uh, screen two. There we go. So I think you should be able to see. I think it's just my presentation you can see. Um, is that right? You can see the whole PowerPoint screen. Oh, there we go. Yep. Perfect. There we go. I've just got a second computer screen and it's really thrown me because usually I would just share one screen, but I had to pick what screen. there. Anyway, uh, so um, yeah, I'm David Harkin. I'm the climate change scientist at Historic Environment Scotland. And I'm really delighted to be asked along tonight to do a um, bit of a presentation for you on uh, climate change and its impacts on the historic environment. I've got a couple of wee bits on Dundonald uh, thrown in there just for good measure, knowing uh, the audience tonight. Um, but essentially what we'll do is I'll give you a run through of um, how Scotland's climate uh, is changing and what it might look like in the future. Uh, we'll then think about what those changes might mean for Scotland's historic environment and what the impacts of climate change are on the historic environment. And then just to end us off um, on a, a sort of short note, we'll just have a, a, a sort of a couple of slides on how the historic environment could actually um, act as a sort of catalyst for climate action. So, so as to end on a sort of more uplifting note, because sometimes it's a wee bit doom and gloomy just talking about climate change and its impacts, etc. So, um, so that's the rough, um, it's the rough structure for the talk. Uh, any questions, uh, like uh, like mentioned, pop them into the chat and I can get them at the end. Or if I say something that is really, really just not easy to understand or I've completely and utterly confused you all, then please do feel free just to sort of stop me mid-flow and I can try and repeat a slide and help you um, understand. Um, the first bit, there's quite a lot of graphs and charts uh, and other numbers and stats, etc. And then in the second half, I've tried to um, offset that a wee bit by just having lots of pictures. So, first section, um, Scotland's changing climate. I'm going to give you a wee bit of information about what the current climate is like, give you some information on how the climate has already changed in Scotland, and then a wee bit on what Scotland's future climate might look like, so how it might continue to change in the years ahead. And before I show you any kind of the science-y stuff, I thought I'll just start right off. It's almost like high school geography, but I think this is a really impactful slide just to get people thinking about why Scotland's climate is the way it is. And because of where we're positioned, so we're just off continental Europe, we're in the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, our weather gets influenced by lots of different air masses. Um, and you'll have heard the phrase, you know, you can experience four seasons in one day in a place in Scotland. Well, actually, it's really quite true because depending on what way the wind's blowing, um, the, the, the weather and the climate can change really quite quickly. And um, yeah, people have to react to that. Uh, so you might remember, for example, uh, Beast from the East back in 2018, I think that particularly um, bad period of snow, there was a red warning for snow, I think, issued over the central belt. You know, we got that type of weather because it was coming during the winter months and from the continent. Uh, during the uh, winter and autumn months, you might, well, you'll be familiar with all the named storms that we get that sort of roll in off the Atlantic Ocean. So they come from the southwest or the west and they tend to bring quite a lively atmosphere, lots of rain, etc. Um, this winter, winter past, yeah, there was a quite a prolonged cold period, actually, something that we hadn't seen for a number of years. And that was because the prevailing um, weather was coming down from the, the sort of polar regions, so from the north. And then every now and then you kind of hear in the news that, you know, there's Saharan dust landing on people's cars and stuff, particularly in the south. And that's because you've got hot air coming up over from the south over the continent. So anyway, there's lots of different types of weather that influence our sort of day to day climate or there's lots of different types of climate that influence our day to day weather uh, up here in Scotland. I looked at some stats for Dundonald just out of interest. So Dundonald is actually just a wee bit warmer than the Scotland and UK average. Uh, so the average temperature is 9.4 degrees over the course of a year. So if you totaled up all the observations recorded that year, the average temperature would be 9.4. 
Uh, but if you look at that map there, you'll see there's actually quite significant temperature variations across the UK. And if you focus in on Scotland, actually, in particular, you'll see that the sort of coastal fringes of the country are a bit warmer than they are inland. And of course, there's a topographic control to all that. So if you're up in the northwest or in the sort of heart of Scotland, you're probably a bit higher above sea level. So the temperature is a bit lower there. Um, you get around about 44 days a month, uh, 44 days a year on average uh, of frost, um, which is a bit lower than the average across Scotland and the UK, but that's because you're sort of nearish the coast, so you've got that influence there. If we look at sunshine, you'd be surprised to know actually that with just over 1400 of 1400 hours of sunshine a year on average in Donald. You're actually one of the sunnier places in Scotland and slightly sunnier than the UK average as well. Now I'm from Ayr, so I'm not far from Dundonald. And I have to say when I was reading that, that even took me as a wee bit of surprise. But when you look at the map there again, and you look at Scotland, the sort of warmer orange and yellow areas are the slightly sunnier areas. And again, that's the coastal fringes of Scotland. So actually, because you're Quite, quite near the coast in Dundonald. There's obviously an influencing factor there. But then if you look at the North West Highlands, it's very gray and doesn't look very good at all, actually. Um, but the sunniest places in the UK tend to get around about 1700 hours of sunshine um, uh, a year. So actually Dundonald's not a crazy amount away from that. Anyway, that took me by surprise to say the least. Rainfall, rainfall is really stark. Um, so what you'll notice there in the east of Scotland, for example, you've got the sort of darker brown colours and the east of Scotland's in a bit of a rain shadow, actually, you know, it's the influence of topography in Scotland. So on the west coast, like in Dundonald, and particularly up in the North West Highlands, we get those sort of southwesterly weather fronts coming in, dumping loads of rain in the western fringes of the country. Uh, so there's quite a stark variation in uh, rainfall across the east and west of Scotland. Dundonald gets just under a thousand millimetres of rainfall a year on average. The Scotland average is 1500, but there's actually parts of Scotland that routinely get over 3000 millimetres of rainfall a year if you total it up and average it out. So Dundonald is, um, is a good bit drier actually than the Scotland average in other parts of the country. So that's like a, a kind of snapshot of the kind of weather conditions that you get just now. Um, but what we do know actually, and we have really, we're really lucky in the UK actually to have quite long climate observation records. So um, um, re observations from weather stations that have been sort of kept for 100, 120 years, et cetera. We've got a really good record of those in the UK. Um, and obviously now we have a, a really good active um, network of weather stations, et cetera, that are sort of gathering in data all the time in our climate. And what we know is that the climate has actually already changed in Scotland. We know that the 10 warmest years in Scotland have now all occurred since 1997. We know that the last decade was around about 0 0.7 degrees warmer than uh, points previous, uh, than, than points earlier in the 20th century. Uh, we know that 2014 was the warmest year on record um, in Scotland. 2018 is the warmest year for the UK as a whole, but for 2014, it was uh, that Scotland's warmest year. We know that rainfall amounts and totals have increased over the past few decades. And we know that our wettest days are actually wetter. So in the west of Scotland, for example, um, on the very wettest days that we get now, around about 36% more rain falls in those days. So that's quite substantial. And it's those types of events that cause the most damage. But there's been a sort of general trend as well, sort of a seasonality to it as well. So our winters are a bit wetter, our summers are a bit wetter. Uh, and we know all this um, without having to take any educated guesses about the future, we, because these are observations. So we know that the climate has changed. And there's been a whole lot of stuff in the news, particularly this week, actually. You'll have seen perhaps on Monday, quite a significant report came out from the intergover, Intergovernmental panel, panel on Climate Change, and they're the kind of leading group of scientists that pull together all the world's climate science and produce sort of reports on the state of the climate almost. So we have a really good understanding of what's driving these changes in our climate, and we know it's not natural cycles anymore. We know it's the influence of humans um, through releasing of greenhouse gases. But anyway, so when we think about climate change, we often think about something that's way off in the future, but actually the climate is already changing. And, and one, of the, one of my favorite images to show this without bog, 
bogging people down with loads of numbers and graphs and charts uh, is this the climate stripes diagram i just think it's really visual and really impactful um, and to help orientate you with the diagram um, each stripe on this uh, image in front of you represents a single year uh, starting in 1884 on the left all the way up to 2018 on the right so i've not um, i've not downloaded the updated one there is an updated version of this now um, each stripe is coloured based on whether that year was warmer than average or colder than average, and the average is the 21st century average. If it's a deep shade of red, that means it was much warmer um, on average. If it's a deep shade of blue, that means it was much colder. Um, it was a much colder year uh, compared to the average. And the, the pattern is it's just really clear and really stark. In the past sort of 20 or 30 years, more often than not, the years we get now are warmer or hotter than they were at other points um, in the past sort of 120 years or so. So I think it's just a really nice visual way of showing you that things are heating up a wee bit. So we know that the climate has already changed a, a bit. Uh, in the past decade, the past century. But I guess really when you're thinking about the um, impacts of climate change, the different risks associated with climate change, you kind of want to know what the future holds. Uh, and again, in the UK, we're really lucky to have these things called the UK Climate Change Projections, uh, UKCP18 for short. They're produced by the Met Office in collaboration with different partners. And oh my, they are, I, I I barely understand how they're created because they're exceptionally complex. They essentially turn mathematical models into these clever systems that mimic the, the world and the weather and our atmosphere. And it's just it's mind blowing science, but it's really good science. Um, and they can use these um, projections and they can use different elements of the Earth system and tease it and sort of uh, play around with it in these models to predict what the future climate might look like. Um, so for Scotland, the, this data set represents the sort of best idea of our future climate or the best, um, yeah, the best projections that we have for Scotland's future climate. Now, the scientists that produce them are really smart. Uh, and because predicting the future is almost impossible, you have to predict a number of different futures. Um, so they have these things called representative concentration pathways. Doesn't, that, the term is not really important, but what these different pathways do is model what the climate might look like uh, in different worlds in the future. And I'll give you an example to try and make this a bit easier to understand. Um, so they have these things called a low emissions pathway and the low emissions pathway tracks a world where we get a handle on our greenhouse gas emissions and really sort of draw them down out the atmosphere and reduce them really, really quickly. And the low emissions world is the world that we want to live in in the future. But then there's this other pathway called the high emissions world and the high emissions world tracks a world where we do not get a handle on our emissions and you uh, there's significant new investment in coal fired power, for example, around the world. So that's that's a world that we don't want to live in. But the difference between these two worlds and the influence it has on the climate is actually taken into consideration in these models. So when we're looking at future change, we talk about a high emission world and a low emissions world. And that's what that graph there is kind of trying to show you. So. Um, on the graph, we're looking at how Scotland's winter temperature might change in the future. The red shaded area tracks that high emissions world. So what you see is after the year sort of 2050, the increase in temperature starts to really ramp up and sort of the, this curve starts to get quite steep. The low emissions world, which is the blue shaded area, that's the world we want to live in. And um, when we do get a handle on our emissions, what you see is that the rise in temperature is less extreme and it almost stabilizes. It's wavy because there is year on year variability in the climate anyway, but it stabilizes the climate at around about 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming. Whereas in that high emissions world, there could be anything in a really, really bad case scenario, anything up to six degrees of warming plus, which is, you just don't want to think about that. But anyway, so we have these projections and we have a pretty good idea of how Scotland's future climate could look. So that's actually pretty cool because that information is really, really useful when thinking about different climate impacts and risks and how that might go into impact stuff like the historic environment that we can talk about in a wee bit. Even aside from all that uncertainty that exists and how the world might handle its emissions, there are some kind of general statements of change that we know to be true for our future climate. 
So we know that our winters, even if we do really, really well, we know that our winters are going to get warmer and wetter. We also know that our summers are going to get hotter and drier. And actually in Scotland, that maybe sounds quite nice, um, but a hotter, drier summer actually brings with it uh, more intense rainfall events. So even though it's drier overall, when it does rain, it's likely that it will be much heavier. And the Met Office have quite a nice wee diagram that explains that, which I've got here. So, um, so we know that uh, warm air rises from the oceans, forms clouds, comes over the land and then falls as rain. But in the future climate, when the world is warmer, a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. Uh, and in the summer months, it creates uh, like heavier rain. Uh, so it means that when it rains, you get those really sort of intense torrential bursts of rain um, and actually me and Blythe were just talking before this about an event that happened in Dundonald um, I think it was 2019 or 2018 it was July uh, and there was a really really significant rainfall event over the over Dundonald and that caused flooding at the castle and I'm sure it caused flooding down the high street and places like that and that's because you got a really significant burst of rain in a really short period of time so even though our summers are drier overall on paper, uh, those really intense rainfall events become more frequent and actually they are the most damaging types of events. So a hot or dry summer, although it sounds nice on paper in Scotland, is, is not ideal. So anyway, but it's an incentive to do what we can to keep greenhouse gas emissions down. Um, there's some other sort of general trends that we know to be true about Scotland's future climate as well. So we know that we have quite a variable climate already, like the four seasons in one day. Um, so we know that our climate will remain variable. So that remains to be true. We know that temperatures will increase across all seasons. Like I said, summers hotter and drier, winters warmer and wetter, intense rainfall events increase in frequency. We know sea levels are going to rise, not so much an issue for Dundonald, uh, and we know that we'll experience less frost and snowfall events as well. So there's, that's a sort of summary of statements for Scotland's future climate. So we know the climate's changed, we know it's going to continue to change. Of what we kind of want to know and what I want to know in my own role at Historic Environment Scotland is what the impacts of this change are on the historic environment. Now I've got another Met Office diagram here that I really like, um, so I'll, help, I'll orientate you into this diagram as well. So in the centre we've got greenhouse gas emissions uh, and uh, change in land use etc and that's a, that is a driver of climate change. And then in the middle circle you've got how that changes the climate system. So greenhouse gas emissions lead to uh, more extreme weather, warmer land and air, warmer oceans, rising sea levels, uh, etc. changes in ocean currents. So that's that middle circle. So that's the changes in the climate system. And then changes in the climate system then have impacts on people and places. Um, so for example, risk to water supplies because it's hotter and uh, there's a uh, increased risk of drought, uh, localised flooding because you get those really intense bursts of rain, uh, damage to marine ecosystems, loss of biodiversity. So on that outer circle you've got all these different types of impact. And these different types of impact can all have a negative effect on the historic environment. Though not all changes are always bad, we generally talk about climate change uh, because it, as, as a bad thing, because it's not a good thing. So why is the historic environment at risk from climate change? Is one of the is a good place to start, I guess. Um, and we often describe the historic environment as being on the front line of climate change. Uh, and we do that because uh, we kind of feel that it is, and it's not it's not the it's not the fault of the people that built those places where they are hundreds of years ago, um, because they did so with sort of set common sense in mind so for example lots of people built their towns and villages and stuff on the coast because it was easier to travel by water back in the day uh, you know you had the sort of more fertile lands and soils along the coast you had uh, access to the sort of um, uh, different industries like fishing and um, things like that so being by the coast was 
advantageous. Um, but today that obviously means that there's a risk from things like sea level rise and coastal erosion. Um, the historic environment is often a kind of like linchpin as well for towns and villages. And I think Dundonald is probably a good example of that. But another example just across the Firth of Clyde would be somewhere like Ross, Rossi, where you've got the castle in the middle, you know, so one of the earlier settlements there. And then the, these focal points act as places where towns and villages and stuff spring up. So, um, so you've got a, a site there because there was some sort of strategic benefit and now you've got a town there because it kind of grew up around it and you've kind of got the perfect mix now of um, accidentally being in places that are more vulnerable or exposed to the impacts of climate change and I guess Dundonald is part of that as well because it's no mistake that the castle is built on that hilltop you know because it's a great vantage point for the area round about and it's no mistake that people would have been using that vantage point for uh, thousands of years you know, not even the castle in its current form today but way back to the sort of pre pre prehistory um so it's no mistake that these places are built in areas that are vulnerable to changes in the climate and if you think about Dundonald on its sort of little hilltop there and um, quite exposed to uh, storms and um, you know sort of wind driven rain etc coming in from the southwest over the Firth of Clyde and uh, I think Aaron does a, a slight slightly okay job at protect, protecting us sometimes from the worst of um, the incoming storms but um, yeah there's reasons why the historic environment is vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and it's often rooted back in the fact that there was some sort of strategic benefit to being in that location in the first place. So when I talk about the impacts of climate change on the historic environment, I will tend to talk about macro scale impacts and micro scale impacts. Now I would classify micro scale impacts as the impacts of climate change that affect the building, specific building. So some examples of that would include localized flooding, you know, sort of increased saturation of uh, building fabric and building material particularly if it's not in the best of maintenance or the sort of best conservation. Uh, you get increased rates of biological growth, for example, caused by increased levels of rainfall and warmer temperatures. Um, so you get a sort of mix of things going on that can impact places at the building scale or the sort of site scale. So that doesn't even have to be a building as such. Um, so I would call those the sort of micro scale impacts of climate change. I'm a geologist, kind of, by my background so I often think about how the the stone responds to the climate and um, that's kind of where my interest or main interest lies uh, and this diagram here uh, is actually really old uh, so it's from a paper uh, a sort of journal paper from the 19 it's the 1950s or something so I wouldn't usually go that far back to be quoting literature back today for climate change because you would go to sort of more current readings but it's really this is a really really cool paper and um, so the diagram shows you the relationship between annual rainfall and mean temperature and the different types of stone decay that you would expect to find um, in different climates essentially so along the uh, along the bottom axis there the the x-axis that's annual rainfall and then the y-axis that's mean temperature and what I got, I got some data for a weather station down in, and um, this is for uh, Three Castle, so it's a station down in Dumf Dumfries and Galloway, so not drastically different from Dundonald. And I plotted the data on, and if you use your eye of faith, um, the red and orange dots are the most recent decades, and there is a slight trend in there of um, uh, the type of stone decay being favoured down in the southwest, moving from sort of moderate chemical weathering of stone with frost action over towards more um, stronger chemical weathering. And that makes sense because if you've got less frost, for example, then that's a type of mechanical weathering that shatters stone. But if there's less frost and that happens less often, you would imagine. And um, so it moves towards stronger chemical weathering. So there's sort of micro scale impacts going on at the site level that you actually even need a microscope to look at. You know, that's it gets into that sort of um, level of detail to the impacts of climate change on sites. So as a geologist, that's kind of what speaks to me, the sort of way that the different um, materials that are used in the historic environment respond to climate change. The next type 
is the macro scale. So the sort of big landscape type changes that are happening that are impacting the historic environment. So things like wildfires, coastal erosion, floods, um, things like that. So you can you can kind of picture all those in your head. In, in fact, three is the picture there in the bottom middle image there. And if you look in close enough, you'll actually just see the castle poking out there um, in a and when the river was in a sort of high state of flood. Um, but the castle has stood for 700 years and probably flooded every other year since then. So there's a certain inbuilt resilience to places like this as well, because even though people were building in areas that might be susceptible to flood, they were probably building with the fact that it will flood in mind, which is important. And we can touch on that in a couple of slides time. The macro scale things are directly linked to the climate though. And this is, I like using this example just to show the relationship between a sort of large scale natural hazard event that could impact the historic environment and the climate. Uh, this is an example from 2012 from the BGS, the British Geological Survey. Uh, and what it's showing us is the relationship between rainfall and the number of landslides that were recorded that year. Um, so the blue bars, they're showing us the, um, how much rain fell. The black dotted line is showing us how much rain we expected to fall that month. The red solid line is showing us how many landslides were recorded each month. And the red dotted line is showing us the average number of landslides that usually occur in that month. And the key relationship here is that um, when we get into the second half of the uh, year, you've got a lot more rain falling. In fact, you've got above average rainfall falling in quite a few of the months. Uh, and that cause some sort of threshold to be crossed and the amount of rain um, experienced resulted in a really steep uh, increase in the number of landslides um, experienced. And you can sort of talk about that in terms of multiple different hazards. So, you know, if it rains more, it floods more. If it rains more, you get more landslides. So the, the way these natural hazard events can materialize and impact the historic environment is directly tied back to the climate. So they're the sort of macro scale impacts of climate change. Uh, my, I guess my go-to when I'm talking about the historic environment is buildings. From that, that's a fault of mine because when I think of the historic environment, my mind instantly does go to places like Dundonald Castle or, um, you know, places that I went and visited as a child, perhaps that I've sort of like imprinted on my mind. Um, but the historic environment is actually so much more than just buildings. Um, it's gardens and designed landscapes. It's, um, you know, sort of marine historical deposits, shipwrecks, etc. There's the coastal zone is just jam-packed full of um, the, the sort of um, jam-packed full of evidence of human occupation going back thousands, thousands of years. You've got surface remains, and I, I think I would actually classify Dundonald's. Um, Dundonald is kind of like a hybrid. It's sort of surface remains because it's um, slightly ruinous but then it's also a roofed building. Um, so it kind of straddles a couple of different themes, but surface remains is another element. You've got buried remains. So sort of archeology span that's um, still to be found or has been found and recovered sort of under the ground. And somewhere like Dundonald, you've got the upstanding monument that everyone sees, but actually the archeological potential of the ground round about Dundonald, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, you know, that will be rich in evidence of past occupation of the site that's no longer visible. So you've got buried remains that can be impacted by climate change. And then you've got collections and internal fabric. So a lot of the places that, and I'm talking about HES, Historic Environment Scotland here, a lot of the places we look after do have collections associated with them. So different objects related to the site's past that are also stored there and they can be impacted by climate change too. And then of course, roof buildings and infrastructure. And we include infrastructure in this because if you think about somewhere like uh, like the fourth bridge, for example, um, you know, that is an active railway line in use today, a critical piece of Scotland's transport infrastructure, but it is also part of the historic environment because it's, it's old, but it's really cool as well. And it's really important. So infrastructure is part of this story here as well. So you've got these seven elements of the historic environment and each of them are kind of, uh, each of them are impacted by climate change in different ways. So I was just going to run through a few examples for each of these. And this is in, these are extracts from a guide that we published a couple of years ago. And I can share links with this because it goes into a lot more detail if you're interested, that is. 
Um, but if you think about the coastal historic environment, for example, um, and you don't need to read the text here, sorry, it's just to, um, this is more about the image, just to get you thinking about what the coastal historic environment looks like. And um, again, I picked this photo because, again, as a geologist, these are the slate isles. So these islands are, these islands roof the world, and you see actually the quarries that are now infilled with um, salt water, etc. So the 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 geology is really cool, um, but it's part of the historic environment because there's traditional buildings and um, a sort of traditional village, uh, and actually, the slate quarries themselves I think are part of Scotland's industrial past, which is also part of the historic environment. Um, but on the coastal zone here, uh, impacts from climate change are quite. I think people would be able to guess quite a few of them, but so it's things like sea level rise, increased rates of coastal erosion, uh, saltwater intrusion actually can impact the preservation state of buried archaeological remains, but so um, a sort of salty air can also um, uh, increase rates of decay as well in building fabrics, um, so in uh, stonework used in somewhere like Dundonald Dund 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 Castle, for example. So the, there's a sort of salty aerosol that um, uh, you find in coastal environments. So the impacts in the coastal zone are, I guess, quite straightforward to understand because it's kind of exposed to things like sea level rise and coastal erosion. So for surface remains, and surface remains is quite, a, it's like an all-encompassing topic, but here we're talking about sort of ruinous buildings and castles. We're talking about standing stones and um, sort of chambered cairns and sort of th things that don't function necessarily as they were once intended to, I think is a sort of nice way of wrapping it up. Um, but for places um, like uh, what you see in front of you, so that's Sweetheart Abbey down in Dumfries and Galloway, it of course doesn't have its roof anymore and that means it doesn't handle and deal with rainwater the way it was supposed to um, you know it doesn't shed water uh, in a sort of efficient manner uh, and that can lead to problems with increased rates of erosion uh, and vulnerable stonework sort of greening and vegetation growth getting established and um, sort of exposed wall heads etc uh, if it's in the coastal environment then you could have that marine aerosol as well you know sort of fusing salts into the stonework which can decay the uh, decay the stonework quicker but then from underneath the ground as well you could have things like rising groundwater so a rising water table um, sort of linked to rainfall that can cause enhanced rates of erosion as well uh, for those particular types of sites so roofed buildings and infrastructure now i don't know if you can tell but obviously being from the West Coast, I did try to infiltrate this guide with pictures of places that I like. So this is Weems Bay, the train station at uh, Weems Bay, because I think it's just like, I think it's pretty stunning actually. Um, but for roof buildings and infrastructure, the impacts of climate change are not too dissimilar from surface remains. So, you know, uh, increased extreme weather events can lead to damage of buildings and water inundation, uh, depending on the materials used that will respond to climate change in different ways as well. So increased rates of stone decay um, or other critical elements of the building as well. It's not so much a problem in Scotland, although it's not unheard of, but actually prolonged periods of drought and the soil drying out can lead to ground heave as well. So, you know, you can sort of shift foundations of buildings if the conditions are changing quite substantially in the ground, um, driven by hotter summers and drier summers, etc. Um, but not because of Scotland's geology, not just as much of an issue up here as it is down south, but not unheard of. Um, Actually, you can have quite um, uh, profound effects on building fabric from uh, just heat in Scotland, and you might be that you might think how, um, but uh, uh, a surface will heat up quite rapidly. You know, I for my dissertation at Glasgow University, I walked around the building for like a month and just with a thermal camera, like measuring and mon monitoring the temperature of the stonework. Uh, that's the kind of cool things that you get up to if you're doing a geology degree. And actually some stones in the um, in the quads, you, you can get up to 40 degrees in temperature on the surface because uh, it's in just indirect sunlight. So there can be quite profound thermal stresses as well put onto building fabric as well. And if Scotland gets hotter and drier, uh, then that could lead to changing types of decay as well in the properties and buildings. 
uh, gardens and design landscapes. So this is Killeen Castle, again, so I'm representing the West Coast strongly here. Um, but uh, so gardens and design land landscapes are a really important part of the historic environment. Um, the impacts here are a wee bit different. So, you know, changing flora and fauna of the of these spaces. So as it gets warmer, it drives in new pests and new invasive species that might impact the ones that are already here and established. It might be that the climatic conditions become such that the species and flora and fauna that we do know and recognize can't quite thrive here in the way that they have to, with the way that they have been able to in the past. So that can change the look and the character and the feel of these places and uh, over time. And it might be that more resilient species are needed to be used, you know, to sort of future-proof these places. But I guess that comes down to um, the sort of landowners and people that look after these places. But the, so the impacts here are a wee bit different. Marine, so this is somewhere where I am not an expert in the slightest, uh, but marine archeology. span so uh, the Firth of Clyde will be jam-packed full of shipwrecks uh, and some types of shipwreck are better at dealing with the impacts of climate change than others. So for example, uh, as the world warms, the oceans and the seas actually absorb a hell of a lot of the heat uh, and the CO2 and that makes them more acidic. So if they're more acidic, that means that the preservation potential of say metal shipwrecks plummets, um, but not so much wooden shipwrecks because they, if they're in the right conditions, they can survive a bit longer. But the changing climate impacts the sea and the oceans and that can impact the preservation potential of archaeological deposits um, in those places. Collections and internal fabric. Um, so by internal fabric, that means the doesn't necessarily mean like the carpets and the curtains, but it means the sort of the internal fittings as well of a property. So you know, like floors and uh, plaster and um, uh, things like that. So the changing climate for these internal things, collections and fabric. Again, it's actually linked uh, to pests and to species. So. Um, if you've got a nice historic traditional interior and it is jam-packed full of soft furnishings, then it's probably a haven for moths um, who like to eat through all that stuff. Uh, in a warmer climate, the moth or the sort of the, the, the moth that causes the most problem in the UK and sort of these historic places, it has more breeding cycles. So it might be able to reproduce two or three times a year normally, but in a warmer climate, it can just keep doing it the whole year round um, and keep producing more moths. So it, the, the Pre prevalence of different pest species can be impacted quite um, quite largely by um, climate change, particularly by a sort of warmer climate. And the other thing to think about here is what the outside of the building is like. So if it's in a good state of repair, then it's fairly resilient to certain changes in the climate. But if it's not, then you might have issues with damp and mould and water ingress, etc. And that can affect um, collections as well. And also, depending on, on the type of collection, you want to keep quite good environmental conditions on the inside to keep the state of preservation of those objects uh, sort of, um, uh, I've lost my train of thought there, you want to basically relative humidity. So uh, if you have fluctuating relative humidity, that can impact the state of preservation of certain uh, collections internally. Um, so if it fluctuates all the time, that's bad. So you want to keep a nice steady environmental condition in which to store your objects and climate change can make that more difficult. This is the last one, so um, so buried remains. So by this, we kind of mean archeological deposits that are not exposed, they are buried. We might know they're there because they've been excavated in the past and then recovered, but a hell of a lot of the time, we don't know what's there. So it's sort of talking about the archeological potential of places. Now climate change can impact these in many different ways. So for example, um, if the ground is drying out, then that can affect the state of preservation of certain materials underground and it can lead to their loss or to rapid rates of decay. If they're on the coastal zone, like the um, image you see in front of you here is from links of Notland up in Orkney and in the left corner of the sort of exposed sandy bit, you'll see a kind of black shadowy area. Uh, and that's a Neolithic settlement that has been getting um, exposed because of wind erosion, so not just coastal erosion by the sea, but actual wind erosion stripping away the um, protective layer of the dunes that had preserved this um, Neolithic farming settlement for thousands of years. 
So the impacts of climate change can start to expose these archaeological deposits. It can change the conditions in which they've been preserved uh, and cause them to be lost. Uh, and actually, I have a wee story I want to tell you about Links of Notland because, um, so I've mentioned a few times, I'm a geologist, not an archaeologist, but I have to write about stuff to do with archaeology and um, different preservation rates, etc. because of my job. So I asked if I could go and get a wee bit of experience out in the field as an archaeologist. Um, so uh, uh, thankfully I had colleagues who were really up for this and they said, absolutely. So I got to go to Links of Notland uh, summer Oh, September 2017, I think it was, and the weather was awful. But I was up there for a week um, as an archaeologist, so I got to go and help excavate a bit of the site. And the site is really cool, and I have another picture I want to show you. Um, so this is a, a scan of the settlement. So it's a Neolithic settlement, quite similar to Scarabray, if you're familiar with that, which is also on the Orkney, uh, that's on Orkney mainland. This is on Westray, one of the other islands in the Orkney archipelago. Um, and this scan here kind of gives you a sense of the scale of the site. So it's a, a farming settlement with different houses and structures and tunnels and pathways. And it's just incredible. It's really, really incredible. Um, and Historic Environment Scotland has been undertaking emergency excavations at the site for a number of years now because the archaeology was getting actively lost from the site because of wind erosion and the breakdown of the dune system that was covering it. And just as well they were because they've found some really cool stuff up there. So on the right hand side you've got um, the Orkney Venus uh, and that is the earliest representation of the human form ever found in the UK, I believe still, uh, which is really cool. But I actually think the bone pin on the left hand side is way cooler because I found it. And I found it on day one of being up there as a, as a trainee archaeologist for the day, much to the dismay of all my actual archaeology friends who say that you don't usually find something within a few hours of stepping foot on a site. Um, but that's a, a 5,000 year old carved bone pin um, that I found at the site and I just think it's really cool. Um, but there's a kind of a there's a point to this story because the impacts of climate change on different parts of the historic environment, in many cases, there's not much you can do about it. So you have to accept an element of loss, I think, of the historic environment when it comes to climate change, because you cannot protect everything. But in the process of accepting loss, there's actually a decision to be made. So in the case of Links of Notland, the decision was taken to excavate the site. So before any more substantial damage was done, we need to go up and find out more about that site so it can, you know, sort of give up its secrets and tell us about the people that once inhabited that place. So actually the recording and then the monitoring of that site through scanning, that's that first image I showed you, is actually part of that process of loss. And for me, actually, that's probably one of the, the most, I don't really know how to describe it, but one of the most significant connections I've ever had with the past was actually finding that bone pin, because you, you kind of go like through this like whirlwind time warp back 5,000 years to the person that threw it away, and then 5,000 year old 5,000 years later, there's like little old me just like rocking up to be a pretend archaeologist for the day and finding that bone pin. So actually, in this process of loss, there's a way that you can connect in with different groups and different peoples and different communities um, in a way that wouldn't have otherwise been possible. So even though loss on the surface of it sounds like a bad thing, I actually don't think it's all that bad. It's not brilliant, but it's not all that bad. And loss is kind of, I guess, the the last thing that you would want to happen to the site. So um, so if you think about a historic place that's important to you in your mind and you think about climate change and you, sometimes it's easier to think about this in terms of coastal sites because coastal erosion and sea level rise are, the sea is going to take what the sea wants to take eventually. But you've got a series of, a series of options to try and keep that site for as long as possible. Um, and there's different levels of what we call adaptive intervention. So climate change adaptation is what we decide to do at a place in response to climate change, in response to the impacts of climate change. And for a lot of the historic environment, actually all you need to do is keep it in a good state of maintenance, good state of repair, proactive conservation works, that sort of top tier things here on this pyramid, those sort of things will keep the historic environment well prepared to deal with the impacts of climate change. 
In some cases, though, there might be slight modifications that need to be made. So an example that people often will give is that in a traditional building, you might need to increase the size of your gutters because there's going to be more rain. So that's a, that's a, that's a modification, a slight adaptation to make that traditional structure more resilient to the future climate. In some extremer cases, there's actually examples of um, uh, some historic sites literally being placed in boxes to keep them safe. Uh, and uh, an active example of this just now is in Helensborough, where you've got um, Hill House, the Charles Rennie Macintosh designed villa. It's coated in concrete. Uh, combine that with not the best state of conservation, increased rainfall, you get really bad um, issues there with damp and water ingress and the sites, act, you know, the, the property is melting essentially into the ground. So to slow that rate of decay down, the National Trust for Scotland have built this protective box around the site whilst they dry it out and think of um, what the right intervention is to do at this site to make sure it survives uh, into the future. So external protection is an option. Uh, in some extremer cases, you might relocate or remove the site and build it elsewhere. And there are some examples of this in Scotland. So up in Orkney again, there's um, an example where there was a, um, an eroding um, sort of archeological deposit. Uh, it was a little structure in the community rather than let, deciding that it would just fall into the sea and erode out, decided that they actually want to excavate it, dismantle it, and then rebuild it at their local heritage center. So it's now rebuilt there as a, somewhere that people can still go and visit. So re relocation or removal of some places is an option, but it won't be an option for everywhere. And then of course, there's that final one. There's the, well, the idea that actually there'll be some places that we can't save and they're probably gonna have to be lost, but it's a managed loss. So actually the, the process of letting something go is an active decision and then comes with a whole series of other tasks that need to be carried out alongside it so it's not negligence you don't just let a place go you record it you excavate it you uh, try and let the site give up the information and secrets about the past that it wants to give up before it's lost for good and you try and preserve some of that whether that's people's memories of the site or you know sounds of the site images of the site scans of the site doesn't matter there's loads of ways you can record it for some sort of future so that's a, a kind of run through of different adaptation responses that you could take to the impacts of climate change on parts of the historic environment. Now, some of that's a bit doom and gloomy because uh, it's difficult to put a positive shine on climate change sometimes, um, as you can imagine. But actually, within the historic environment, there's a lot of stuff that we can learn a lot of stuff that we can have to our advantage that might act as a bit of a catalyst for climate action. So things that might encourage people to take action. Uh, and this is where the real true value, I think, of the historic environment might be uh, in the 21st century. And the first thing on my list is learning from the past. So even though I did tell you earlier on that lots of places are built in landscapes or strategic points in the landscape that are now vulnerable, to different climate driven hazards. Uh, in a lot of cases, these places were kind of built in quite sensible places, even though they are in areas at risk. And the, a good example that I like to use is Kilhorn Castle, um, which you see on the right hand side there. That map on the left hand side there is a flood risk map for the area. So the dark blue areas is um, regions of land that are really susceptible to flooding. But Kilhorn Castle is like literally built on the one wee dry spot in the middle there, or just at the to the sort of middle left. Um, that little rocky outcrop is what the castle is perched on. So I just think it's really, I think Kilhorn was actually an island, so cut off from the mainland when it was occupied, but the water level in the lock has changed, which means it's now connected to the um, connected to the sort of mainland. But anyway, there's a story in there, I think, about recognising exposure and vulnerability to different hazards, but then just deciding to build somewhere sensible, to, you know, to mitigate that hazard. And we're probably not all that good at doing that just now when we keep building homes and floodplains and stuff like that. So I think there's, there's definitely something to be learned from the past. And I don't think it's just in where we position places. I also think it's in the materials and the skills that go into constructing these places. You know, so the historic environment is 
built out of natural materials, you know, locally quarried stone and slate. We designed, and again, I'm talking about buildings here, but we designed buildings to deal with a wet climate. So, you know, pitched roofs, overhanging eaves, solid materials that are actually quite robust to even a changed climate in Scotland. Um, but if they're looked after, that is. So there's a lot of stuff you can learn from past practices that we've probably lost a bit today in modern society but if we refound them then we might find a bit more resilience to the impacts of climate change so I think there's there's a role here for the historic environment uh, to play in sort of what I would say you know, learning from the past but I think there's also a role to lead by example and this is me mostly with my sort of historic environment Scotland public body hat on um, but you know, HES is a large operator of visitor attractions, all of which are parts of our historic environment. You know, there's a role here for us to play as an organisation in terms of leading by example. And a good example I can give you of that is what we've done at Edinburgh Castle. So there's been um, an investment at Edinburgh Castle over the past 10 years to relamp it. So LED lights, replace the boilers for more efficient um, exact more efficient models and um, lots of different interventions like that, including actually training up people to sort of better use spaces and keep doors closed and open windows when it gets too hot, etc. Anyway, there's been lots of interventions we've done at the castle to reduce energy usage. And the result of that is that emissions from the castle are down 40%. In fact, it might actually be higher now because these stats are from 2018. Um, so if we can do it somewhere like Edinburgh Castle, then I think think it's possible to do it in other places that are not just as complex. Now, the question you'll ask me is, well, if we all had half a million pounds to invest in these interventions at the castle, then brilliant. But Edinburgh Castle is actually 27 different buildings and, and other supporting infrastructure. So when you break that down to costs across a what is quite a sprawling, complex property of different um, property types, different ages, etc., then it be, that figure becomes not quite as shocking. Um, but the figure that is shocking in the good way is that those investments have already paid off for themselves because of the energy we've saved. So we've all we've saved almost £800,000 on our energy bills, which means we've actually made £300,000 or we've not spent £300,000 that we otherwise would have. So it, the investment has already paid for itself, which I think is cool. So there's a story in there somewhere about us leading by example, and but like I say, I think that's mostly with my sort of historic environment Scotland lead public body hat on. There's a role for us to sort of lead by example in terms of climate action. And then the final thing I'll say about it is that you know the, the historic environment it is part of our everyday life, so it's kind of everywhere that you go, and you probably don't even always notice it. But you know, it's it, it's literally everywhere. The thousands of listed buildings and scheduled monuments and uh, gardens and design landscapes and you know the different historic properties and um different historic landscapes and um yeah there's just there's, there's there's so much of it and i think once you dig deep into your mind you start to think about elements of it that are actually quite important to you so for me for example i used colleen castle in one of those earlier pictures but because I was in air, and I reckon this is the same for pretty much everyone in South Ayrshire, Glen Castle was the only place we got taken on school trips, unless it was Burns, Burns Cottage uh, as well. But though that actually is a really important place to me now because I have really fond memories of it. I have quite a connection to it, I feel. So the, the idea that somewhere like Glen Castle might not exist in 30, 40, 50, 100 years time, doesn't matter, is actually, it's kind of upsetting actually in a way, but might be a kind of catalyst or a prompt for people to think well actually do you know what climate change is something that i need to take more seriously something that i need to see what i can do about it and um, so it might just spark a kind of reaction in people that can help drive the necessary action that's needed but it, ev everyone probably has a different example of a place that's important to them but i reckon once you dive into it you can sort of draw out the a kind of similar reaction to what I feel to somewhere like Killeen. Killeen's a weird one perhaps, but there's loads of there's loads of places that are important to me. Killeen feels like an obvious one because it's close to home and somewhere that I just really like to visit. Uh, this is the last slide. It was just a quote from a colleague of ours at this event I was at a few years ago. And I just think it's really cool. Um, you know, I think it's important that we 
we must turn heritage from being a sort of victim of climate change into a catalyst for climate action. And I've raced through loads of examples of how the historic environment can be impacted by climate change. And it doesn't always paint the, the best picture, I suppose, in terms of it's not a very positive outlook. But actually, I think once you dig into it, and once you think about the historic environment, how it's important to people, what it can teach us about the past, how elements of it can lead by example in terms of creating sort of wider societal change that's needed to address climate change, I actually think that the historic environment can be a catalyst for climate action and that it should be a, a catalyst for climate action. So even though sometimes working in climate change, it does feel a bit hopeless and doomy and gloomy, I do actually have a kind of uh, a flame of hope still alive that we'll, we'll actually get through all this and the the past week's been difficult actually with the big report that came out on Monday sort of talking about the reality of climate change etc but even the sort of lead scientists that were pulling those reports together they they were still talking about the hope they have because there is still a chance to do something about the crisis as a whole and um, so yeah I think hope yeah I think hope's important but anyway that's me uh, I could waffle on for uh, so much longer but I'll leave it there and yeah that was a, a whistle stop tour of the impacts of climate change on the historic environment that was absolutely fantastic thank you so much David and we have a bit of a lively conversation going on in the oh, chat brilliant. I haven't awesome. seen anything yet <laughs> uh, and I think we'll start back at the beginning, if that's okay. And our archaeology coordinator, Lauren, had asked um, back when you were looking, you were kind of working through a few slides that were looking, it looked like a booklet, maybe an HES booklet on climate change. And she was wondering if maybe you had a link to that. She says that we're looking to do a climate change session with our young archaeology club and said this could be a great resources or a great resource for this. Are there uh, printed copies available? And also do you have a link? And then uh, yes, I might add on to that if you have any other sources that you want to share with the audience that um, we could sort of go on to read more on top of that that you might put links in for. Yeah, uh, so I've just so I think the um, publication you're talking about is our impact guide. Uh, so I've just posted a link to that uh, in the chat. Uh, we actually do have physical copies of it in the office that I've only been in once in 18 months. <laughs> but um, next time I'm in, I could arrange to get some, I'm sure I could arrange to get some sent down to the to the visitor center. I just, yeah, I can send you a box if you'd like that. Yeah, that would be great. I think it's a great opportunity to speak to people about it. We do get people coming in and asking about it. Um, and Blythe, obviously as the education officer, I'm sure that's um, a topic that she might want to talk to about the kids. We have ran um, climate change sessions in our education programme before, and the kids are absolutely fascinated by it. Um, so any resource we can basically get our hands on, then we will utilise. <laughs> I can, I yep, next time I'm in, I can pack up a box and send, I'll get them sent down. That's not a problem. Excellent. Thank you so much. Right, next we have Aaron Johnson. Um, and he said, I'm very interested in how the climate, the changing climate will affect the archaeological remains across the country, particularly around the coastal areas and low lying islands like Orkney. I've been working for years in rescue archaeology and in particular development led archaeology, and we have always been told that we should leave as much archaeology as possible in situ that is not directly impacted by the development for future generations to excavate with hopefully better technology and techniques. Usually this idea to dig just enough is also justified to excavate a low representative sample of the overall site area and thereby keep costs down for the customer. With climate change and sea level rise, et cetera, this blows our assumptions out of the water. After listening to your talk and the impacts along the coastal zone, we obviously must completely change and revise our model of rescue and research archeology span to excavate as much as possible in areas prone to flooding or rising levels. So currently, as far as I know, there's been no major paradigm shift in general archaeological methodology in the private or public sectors over Europe, outside the few university lectures that are trying to sound the alarm bells. What changes, what research agendas changes in archaeological archaeology methodology, planning legislation and funding for coastal rescue slash research archaeology in historic environment Scotland? In, 
or is, is historic environment Scotland implementing in the near future to counter these changes in climate? Uh, yeah, so, oh my goodness, there's loads to unpack in that. But, yeah, um, there's a so bit I, more, but I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> so uh, the first comment would be that, um, so the, on the point around how there has to be kind of changing practices in order sort of in response to the climate crisis, I think is 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 bang on, is spot on. And actually a lot of my job is about, um, uh, it sounds really boring, but it's about climate change risk assessment. So it is, it is about trying to understand in terms of HES's properties, what properties are most at risk from climate change? And therefore, can we use that information to perhaps funnel future funding for sites, conservation works, et cetera, or think more radically, rad radically about changes that actually need to be made at those sites specifically to deal with climate change? So the, I guess you can kind of scale that up to the whole country, you know, if you have a kind of or like a risk assessment of coastal heritage, then perhaps that starts to tease out areas that are more vulnerable to loss than others. And actually a lot of that work I think is getting done. Um, so you've got really great groups like ESCAPE, Scotland's Coastal uh, Archaeology and the Problem of Erosion. And they've got, th th this, they've got just this incredible track record of looking at um, coastal heritage at risk. And they've got an, uh, an app that um, people can contribute data to for at-risk sites to monitor them. They've got a watch list of sites that are potentially most at risk from things like coastal erosion. There's another project called Dynamic Coast, which is mapping coastal change around Scotland's soft coastline. So it's actually providing a sort of more scientific evidence base for places in the country that are more vulnerable to coastal erosion. And that data can be used by anyone. Anyone can go onto that website and check it out. So that could be used to help identify areas where there's more risk. And then in terms of what HES is doing about it, well, actually HES funds projects like SCAPE to do to exactly do this to go out there and think about um coastal heritage assets that are most at risk at climate change and then do something about it so the example i gave you of where the a community group had actually dismantled uh, excavated and dismantled um it's called the muir burnt mound they dismantled it and then rebuilt it at their heritage center so that was a project sort of driven um, that was sorry not driven that was a project supported by scape driven by the local community so yes there's lots of stuff that HES can do and is doing, um, but there'll be so much more as well. Guys, I should say at this point, you're very welcome to turn your cameras back on. Don't feel like you have to, but you're welcome to turn your cameras on and, you know, join in the discussion if you like. Um, and there's a second half of Aaron's question. It says, um, and I think you've kind of gone over this a little bit in your answer here, but he says also our climate scientists slash geologists like yourself working closely with arche the archaeological sector to plan ahead for the future. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's most of the that's the main gist of the question there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, and um, uh, I'm, so I'm just thinking of my own experience in HES again, actually, and there's quite a few people with my sort of background, so kind of geologists and environmental scientists. And uh, as you would expect, there's a lot of people with that sort of archaeological background. In fact, my line manager is an, in fact, every line manager I've ever had at HES comes from an archaeological background. So we all, we are all sort of mixing and working together and sort of trying to solve a common problem with the different bits and pieces of expertise that, um, that we can bring to the problem. So yeah, there is definitely, I sense that there's a, a reasonably good uh, sort of mixing of skills and sort of interdisciplinary um, action that is required, uh, is my sense. Uh, Gwen has asked, do you think we might well need to employ more people as emergency archaeology teams in the future if we're anticipating a variety of environmental damage? Uh, yeah, well, I sort of my gut reaction to that is so as someone that has doesn't have a budget, as someone that doesn't uh, hire or implement any of this type of stuff, I feel it's easy for me to say that yes, we absolutely probably do should have more of those skills, but um, I guess not really something that no, it's not really what I do day to day. So I, I guess I couldn't comment on the practicalities of, of that. But certainly if there's going to be more places at risk, potentially more places being lost through the process of climate change, then uh, it sounds like those sort of emergency reactive, um, well, actually, 
they, they don't have to be reactive, they can be proactive responses to um, hazards like that, then yeah, it sounds like those skills are needed. I, I, I don't know if you've made it through the chat, but I sense that that seems to be a part of what was getting mulled over in the chat as well is sort of where the where the money's gonna gonna come from for that. Um, oh, yeah, not hey, me, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Mateo asked if precious or historic items are under the seabed, would these possibly be damaged as well due to the erosion of the seabed because of climate change? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that the sort of that would come back to sort of changing um, coastal dynamics, etc. So uh, depending on where they are, then you could have like an influx of sediment from sort of terrestrial land that rapidly buddies things and alters their state of preservation. You could have, I guess, currents and stuff ripping up uh, and exposing deposits uh, as well. So the example I gave, so it's not marine coastal, but links of Notland. There was a the, so the dune system at Links of Notland had been there for thousands of years. Uh, and uh, this is, I repeat this from colleagues who have told me this, um, the, what they think happened is there's been some sort of change in the bay uh, and then the sediment supply to the dunes sort of stopped or broke down or, you know, sort of didn't, it, the sediment supply wasn't as forthcoming as it was previously and that's caused the dune system to break down. So that just kind of gives a, a flavor for the sort of, the connection between sort of marine and terrestrial processes and how they're sort of interlinked and quite dynamic. I guess that's why the Dynamic Coast project is called Dynamic Coast, because it's quite a, a rapidly moving, evolving sort of part of our landscape. Uh, and Marisha has asked, is there a concern that a lot of our planning relies on averages and it's easy to not plan well? for the now more frequent extreme events that do the most damage. For instance, a lot of recent damage to Dundonald Castle was caused by a very few days of extreme cold this spring, even though temperatures on average are going up. Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. I, av yeah, averages only tell one part of the story and uh, a lot of what I presented to you was averages, but there are good data sets out there that look at um, more of the climate extremes and certainly um, uh, institutions and organizations like the Met Office have recently sort of put out, um, a, a, oh my goodness, like an extensive um, pile of research into weather extremes and how they'll change in the future. So for example, extreme rainfall events, um, kind of like the one that hit Dundonald a couple of years back, those types of events are likely to increase in Scotland by about a factor of three a day, uh, three a year. So three, up to three of those events a year. Uh, rather than one of those events, you know, maybe a decade. Uh, so that's quite a substantial change. So there is stuff coming through in terms of the extremes. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly a, a steep learning curve that we're all on or a sort of learning as we go with this type thing. Sorry, can I just quickly jump in? Just because I know that we've got people um, in the audience who might want to know this, but what Marisha's talking about um, is to do with the mortar coming off the castle um, after we got the really bad frost back in winter. It's not the reason for the gates and the fences, but up just now, there is no current damage to the castle that we're aware of. Uh, just in case anybody panics at that, but it's got that no correlation between the two. <laughs> it, this winter was quite... Um, uh, I mean, it's certainly not a record breaking cold winter by any means, but compared to what we've been used to in previous years and maybe over the past decade or so, it was a, a colder winter than expected. So we've seen that sort of the impact of frost on a number of different properties as well. So, for instance, at Hollywood Park uh, in Edinburgh, you get quite um, a lot of issues with rockfall uh, in the park because, you know, the, when water freezes, it expands and it expands in volume by like something like 9% or something like that. I think that causes a pressure on the rock and that, that could be stonework, could be mortar. And that action repeated over many years um, can loosen and weaken sort of vulnerable parts of the rock. And then like it seems you've experienced at Dundonald, they can, yeah, they can fall off. Well, I have skipped over in the interest of questions all of the you know fantastic bits of the chat where everyone Gwen and Matteo and Aaron and um, Eleanor absolutely everyone saying thank you this was so interesting um, and it was absolutely interesting um, I don't know if there's anyone else that has questions I might ask mine 
uh, well, any, any, anyone else has a think if they have maybe one or just one more. Um, are there any sites right now that are, you know, don't say us, because even if we are, you know, we're not, but you know, don't say us anyway. Um, any sites that come to mind that we need to be particularly worried about or areas in general that we need to be really worried about? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, for this question, I, I, I would never say somewhere like Dundonald or actually <laughs> I think the the properties in care at HES are actually not, they're not great examples to talk about when you're thinking about loss specifically because there's only 300 of them. That's like at the tiniest fraction of what Scotland's historic environment is. So they're not, they're not truly representative of Scotland's historic environment as such. But if you were to like really pin me and ask me like, what sites do HES look like that have a really uncertain future? Well, then you, you have to think really um, pragmatically and you just have to kind of own it that somewhere like Scatter Bray, for example, up in Orkney on its, uh, right on the edge of the Atlantic, part of a soft soft coastline that is actively eroding. Scarabree's had a sea defence in place since like the 30s and it's been extended a few times. And, you know, you can actually see that that has stopped the site already from partially falling into the sea And um, when you look at aerial photography. So you, you do have to think um, that places like Scarabree, even without climate change, probably wouldn't be around forever. You know, when Scarabray was occupied, it was a kilometre inland. You know, it wasn't by the sea, but coastal erosion is a natural process that happens anyway. Uh, and the sea will take what the sea wants to take. Climate change just speeds up the process. So perhaps Scarabray had like 300 years, you know, to go before it might have been lost. But perhaps with climate change, it, maybe it's something that happens in 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. I don't know. Um, but it, yeah, it's... Um, it's tricky to talk about because places like that are, are obviously very important to people. They're very important to local economies and communities as well. You know, the, there's value in the site in terms of its historic significance, but there's value in a site as well in terms of what it brings to people's lives and to uh, the economic value it brings to local communities, etc. So it's really, there's some really difficult decisions that some people will have to make. I don't think I'm those, that person, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> Thanks so much. Does anyone else have any quest any more questions before we wrap up? In which case, thank you so much, David. That was fascinating. And as you can tell, everybody was really engaged. Everybody had questions. Um, so that was really amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, just a reminder to everyone that's that stuck around to the end, thanks so much for coming. And um, all of our talks are recorded so uh, and Liz has already mentioned that she'll be watching this back just to make sure she's got all the details so fantastic all of our talks are recorded and if you missed the last one or whatever you can watch that one as well um, and those are watchable if you are a member of Friends of Dundonald Castle if you're not it's easy enough to become a member you can do that on our website and our next talk will be same time same place Thursday night seven o'clock on the 16th of September and it's David White Wine Talk. Wine Talk. Yes. Wine. Yeah, that's how you pronounce it, I think. Wine Talk. Uh, and he is going to be talking about uh, castles in relation to the centralization of power in the 15th century. So that's going to be an exciting one. Uh, so look out for our advertising for that. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you then. And thank you again so much, David, for the fantastic presentation. Oh, oh, thanks very much for having me along. And I'm really sorry that I kept changing dates. And oh my goodness, <laughs> I was a nightmare there for a few months with a million different things going on. <laughs> yeah. Right.